Welcome to our video on the history of the Eucharist. This is uh, meant to go in hand in hand with a separate parallel video on uh, what we mean by substance in transubstantiation. Now you will notice uh, we're really avoiding uh, keeping down to the basic level here. Uh, we get a lot of the basics in just general catechesis. But uh, one thing that myself and Canon Peter are very much in agreement with in, in our own personal experience, very few people are given the real opportunity to access the intellectual depth and the riches of our faith. So that's what we're going to try and do with some of these videos. And that's why some of it will be actually quite at a high level. Um, so I do invite you to, to, to freeze or to stop uh, at a particular level or skip to a, an interesting uh, area that you specifically want to learn about. To begin with then, um, we have to start with the Jewish religion. If we're going to understand the, uh, the Eucharist, we have to understand the Last Supper and the crucifixion. We have to then see that in the context of what was going on in the temple, in the Jewish religion, and uh, what the Passover meal was. So if we don't understand what's going on in the temple, we won't understand the Eucharist. The Jewish religion sees sacrifice and meal, a communion meal, to eat the flesh of the sacrificed victim as in inextricably combined. To start off for first principles, though, right at the, the beginning of uh, humankind, uh, we've got this in Genesis, this uh, very clear metaphorical story of our separation from God. At some point at the beginnings of human history, we, uh, we lost our sense of peace. We lost our sense of friendship with God uh, at, at a very deep reality and a level of being which affects us today and uh, the the imagery that we see in Genesis is that the way back is guarded by seraphim and a flaming sword which we've got it's not literal it's but it's a metaphor the way back to friendship with God is barred and that's not God's doing that's ours the way that God deals with that is through enacting covenants most of the covenants, apart from the initial ones, are inextricably related to sacrifice. So God asks us to do something, he gives us all of the information and all of the resources, and then we offer something back uh, in response to God. So we have messed up, we need a way then to make restitution, to make atonement for what we've done, the sins that we've committed. So we take ownership for what we've done to estrange ourselves from God, and we sacrifice something valuable to us in order to ask God's forgiveness, and it's a, a token of that. Uh, so therefore, especially with uh, the early Israelites, it was very much an agricultural society, so a lot of the sacrificial victims, the things that were sacrificed, had to do with agriculture. Uh, by and large, so either grain or, or uh, animals. And at the temple, these would be sacrificed. You also had incense. But um, the, the whole idea of holocausts was that the, uh, that the animal was, was burned. Part of the animal, the flesh, would be eaten and part of it would be consumed by fire on the altar of holocaust. So we see in Leviticus, we've got quite uh, a complex system Certainly by the 6th century BC, we have um, a, a real developed sacrificial system using the temple as the centre of those acts of sacrifice. So as we've seen before, uh, things like bread and grain sacrifices, wine libations, animal sacrifices, uh, specifically Passover, a lamb and incense. So all of these things now hopefully should start ringing some bells and we should make connections in our minds to the Eucharist because all of this is a foreshadowing of the Eucharist to help us explain and understand what the full context of Christ meant to enact when he enacted and instituted the Eucharist. It wasn't in complete separation from all of these things. The Old Testament was a complete preparation uh, to put into context what Christ was asking us to do. What we see, therefore, in the Old Testament, all of these different stories, these different parts, uh, pointing the way to explain the cross 
and the, uh, the Eucharist itself. So Melchizedek is use of bread and wine. Bread and wine are linked with sacrifice in Genesis. Uh, so it's it's not just anything that uh, the bread and wine just didn't, didn't just appear from nowhere it was linked to Melchizedek manna uh, the the spiritual nour nourishment that came down from heaven um, the showbread in the temple the uh, Abraham uh, well attempting to offer his son Isaac in sacrifice Isaac takes the wood of his uh, sacrifice and carries it up to the hill of Moriah, which is where the crucifixion took place. So that brings us on to the Passover indeed. We can only understand the context of the Passover if we remember two things. The Passover is a sacrifice and the Passover is a meal. It's not one or the other, it's both combined. That's the whole point. The Passover sacrificed the lamb at the temple and then the meal is a ritual meal in order to eat, consume the flesh of that lamb after the priest has sacrificed it at the temple. So the family come um, back to their home and consume uh, the flesh of the lamb with four cups of wine. So again, we see wine and bread, unleavened bread. Um, it's all there. It's, it's all uh, in the context of the Old Testament and the Exodus story. Uh, the Last Supper, uh, Although there is a little bit of dispute as to the nature of the Last Supper, it's very clear from the Gospels it was supposed to be a Passover meal. Although uh, our Lord was using the context of the Passover to create something new, a new covenant. Uh, we, as I say, we can only understand the Last Supper through Jewish theology. If we're just making up our own interpretation that's got nothing to do with, with the Passover ritual, then we're obviously going to completely miss the point. The Passover meal was uh, typically, the Seder meal was uh, consumed with four cups and we see from the Gospels, John's Gospel specifically, the fourth cup was not taken, which was an indication, it's um, all in Scott Hahn's book, The Supper of the Lamb, which is excellent, I do recommend you read it, uh, but, but there are other um, sources for it, to, uh, to demonstrate that the crucifixion the next day was part of the same action. The, the Last Supper wasn't just one distinct meal beginning and end. The Last Supper was the beginning of a three-day uh, sacrificial liturgy, essentially. God uh, is outside time and space, so the, the, whole, uh, the whole three days of the Triduum are one event, essentially. So again, comparing the, uh, the Passover to the Eucharist, we can see there's a priest, altar, and victim, which is what you need, three components of sacrifice um, in the Jewish ritual, and the, uh, the lamb is consumed in a supper. Uh, in the Eucharist, and the, certainly the Last Supper, which was the first mass, it wasn't by itself the first mass. The first mass was the Last Supper the crucifixion and the resurrection. That was the first mass. So again, the priest is Christ, uh, the altar, the cross. Uh, there's also a symbology of Christ being the, uh, the altar and Christ was the victim. Hostia, um, um, our, our word host comes from hostia, which means victim. And the last supper was the ritual eating of the sacrificed lamb's flesh. And in this case, which is new, the drinking of his blood, which is otherwise in the past um, uh, absolutely not allowed in Jewish uh, practice because the blood belonged to God and uh, Christ himself was giving his blood, his divinity, his life to um, the apostles and then to the church to be uh, represented for the end of, until the end of time. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, we have the words of institution that are actually missing in John's, interestingly, um, because he has a different focus. Uh, but we can very much see uh, the similarity. The words of institution that we have in uh, the, the liturgy actually predate the Gospels, so they're slightly different wording. We don't take the words of consecration, the words of institution from the Gospels. We take it from an older tradition. And uh, we can see very much do this in memory of me. John 6, the bread discourse. John's gospel, therefore, does give some context, even though it doesn't have the, uh, the, the words of institution and that account in it. It nevertheless, in several ways, sets 
the scene, not least John 6, the famous bread discourse, I am the bread of life, whoever eats of me will inherit eternal life. Luther, centuries later, will have an issue with this, saying that it doesn't apply to the Eucharist, but we'll look at that uh, later. But to, um, to, to me and to, to, uh, uh, to Catholics, that's, that's a very, very clear connection, that he wasn't uh, talking symbolically when it came to the Eucharist. He's actually literally saying, you have to consume my flesh. And he doesn't stop the Jews when they start walking away in disgust. So it's a demonstration that paves the way to uh, the uh, understanding of the Eucharist. St. Paul, uh, Corinthians, rich, rich with uh, 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 Eucharistic meaning and uh, a really valuable insight into uh, the mind of the early church. And um, if you have a look at my video on the altar, uh, you will see this discussion of uh, th this passage here, comparing the altar of sacrifice to the demons, to the altar of sacrifice, um, or the table of sacrifice um, of the Eucharist. So the, the altar in the Eucharist is both a sacrificial altar and a table um, uh, for meal. So it's both sacrifice and meal. That's very much in St. Paul. Um, and also this, uh, the words of institution, slightly different from the Gospels, but they're in there as well. And he mentions uh, this uh, word remembrance. Of course, the, uh, the New Testament wasn't written in English. They didn't use the word memory or remembrance. They used this word uh, anamnesis, the Greek. Um, there's no point in trying to guess what our Lord said in the original Aramaic, which is the language he would have said the, the Last Supper in. Uh, because the revealed scripture is in Greek. So we interpret the Greek as the evangelists uh, uh, gave it to us. So anamnesis is the, the, the key word here. Doesn't mean memory. Doesn't just mean a passive remembrance. It literally, in the context of the first century in Jewish theology, meant bringing the past event into the present. So we're not looking back. We're actually bringing that past event uh, knocking down time and space and bringing it uh, into the here and now, and that's what it means um, to remember, not remember, and represent, not represent. So that's really important to uh, to understand. So the context. This is just revision now, really. The context of uh, the what the crucifixion achieved then was a restoration. Uh, with God's friendship. So that flaming sword, the cherubim, or the cherubim stay uh, in the presence of God, but the flaming sword, the barrier back to God that uh, we see in, in Genesis, again as a metaphor, um, but describing a reality, has been destroyed. Now the result really of the sacrifice of, of Christ, which is uniting the divine with the human once again, and by our shared human nature, bringing us up to heaven. So uh, Christ as, a, uh, as a, a divine person with a human nature acts as our intercessor, as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, uh, which uh, then uh, we, we see in uh, the traditional Roman canon. We see that beautiful uh, imagery of the angel bringing up, which some theologians equate with Christ, um, the, uh, our gifts into heaven to intercede for us. Uh, in the heavenly sanct sanctuary, which our churches are supposed to be a, an earthly representation of, which is the whole point of the temple architecture in, in Judaism. It was a representation of the heavenly sanctuary. If we go to the church fathers, let's understand what Christians believed, uh, those who immediately succeeded the apostles, to have an idea of what they believed about the Eucharist. And we will see there is a very, very clear Catholic sacramental and sacrificial theology all throughout the Church Fathers. So we haven't invented this in the Middle Ages. Everything that Catholics believe have always been believed by Christians all the way back to the time of the Apostles. Sacraments in general, therefore, the um, idea of sacraments is that we we are physical beings. We only have any knowledge of the world around us through our senses, so through sight, smell, touch, um, hearing, etc., etc. God is pure spirit. He is completely outside the material world. So we cannot see God. Sacraments are sacred signs that if we say the right words and do the right action at the same time to give a signification to that action, 
then something supernatural will happen by virtue of the fact that we've said the right words and that we've used the right signs and that we have the intention at least of doing what the church does. With all the sacraments, it's not just an empty symbol. It's not just an empty sign. It's like uh, the best analogy I can find for it really is a gold coin. So the value of the gold coin is printed on the face, but it's also contained in the metal. If you, you get any uh, banknote or any uh, coin uh, out of your pocket, you will find that the, uh, the value on the face of it is just a token. It doesn't actually contain that value. The sacraments are a sign, but they contain uh, the, the value of what they signify. Baptism, the Eucharist, these are visible signs of God doing something, an encounter with Christ by which grace is given to our soul by virtue of the fact that we've um, completed the, the sacrament. The sacraments uh, are intrinsic to the church. They belong to the church. They are mediated through the church. The sacraments have no power except through the church. The church fathers, I'm not going to go through all of these. You can have a look at them yourselves. Uh, have a look at churchfathers.org. It's, it's an excellent resource. And you can see, uh, go online and get books and what have you. You will see none of these quotes are taken out of context. They're all a representation of the Catholicity of the church fathers. They didn't believe the Eucharist was a symbol and they believed that the Mass was a sacrifice. There is unanimity on that issue. I'm just going to go through some of the most important ones really quickly though. Uh, St. Cyril of uh, Jerusalem, he talks about a, a metabaline, um, a, a, a change. It's a change uh, of the wine and the bread into uh, uh, blood and uh, body. Uh, Theodotus Cyrus, it's a bit obfuscated really, it's a bit difficult to, to see exactly what he's saying, but he's very clearly, really, uh, once you look at it properly, that he's talking that the, the outward appearances don't change, but we treat the, the reality of the, the Eucharist as if it is uh, literally the body and blood of Christ. So there's actually, even though it looks like he's being symbolic and, and denying a change, if you read it properly, it, it is all in there. And again, St. Gregory of Nyssa, not only does he actually, uh, he's very clear on the sacrificial nature of the, the Eucharist, but uh, again, this language of change, he doesn't use later terminology uh, such as transubstantiation, but the idea of a change is absolutely there. And it's not just an outward change. It's not just a, a spiritual change, which is more what became uh, Zwingliism. St. Ambrose, again, um, very, very uh, clear that this is the real flesh. This isn't something else. This is actually the same flesh of Christ that was made incarnate in the Virgin Mary. St. Augustine, very clear sacrificial theology here. And although his um, language in uh, symbolism, what have you, it's, it's a bit unclear to, to see how he exactly he's using his terms. There's a very clear um, belief in the, the real presence there. And again, if there wasn't, it wouldn't make sense for him to say that the Mass is a sacrifice. And he does very, very clearly because he knows that we're not just offering bread and wine. And we'll get on to that later. St. John Damascene, again, the language of change very, very clearly. Um, real presence. The Church Fathers are, are unanimous. The Mass being a sacrifice and the real presence of Christ, it's not something that was invented by Rome in the, the Middle Ages. This was something that was, again, around the entire Roman Empire, all of those communities, as far as India, all of those communities that were founded by an apostle all believed the same thing uh, about the Eucharist, that they, the Eucharist was a sacrifice and the real presence was. There was a change and it was the, um, the blood and body of Christ. This was not a later um, development that was forced by Rome. Uh, that's completely, completely unhistoric. And the authority of the church, we, we understand the church not just to be a collection of people in the here and now, but it's much greater. It's, it, it, the church is uh, an abstract reality that exists throughout time and across the world. It's one church. Um, so, and it's, again, the, um, the church, the church fathers, uh, absolutely unanimous. 
the Eucharist in the Middle Ages. This is uh, when theology started developing um, a little bit more systematically um, away from the, the method that the, the Church Fathers used. Um, the first real uh, controversy about the Eucharist uh, happened at Corbier um, in the, well, the 8th and 9th century, really. Uh, Pascasius and Retramnus of Corbier, um, one was abbot and one was uh, a monk, and there was a disagreement between them about uh, the symbolic understanding of the Eucharist and what um, we uh, know as the realist. So, either the Eucharist is an empty symbol or it's it's real. It does really uh, contain the uh, the body and blood of the presence of Christ. Uh, Pascasius was very clear. He's maybe possibly a little bit too much on the realist side, but uh, um, not excessively. So, very clear. This is the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament. Uh, Retramnus uh, disagreed. He felt that if the reality of Christ was present, that the Eucharist was no longer a symbol. And if the Eucharist isn't a symbol, it's not a sacrament. So that's his logic. It didn't uh, cause too much problem until then the 11th century and you've got Berenger of Tours, who really took um, some of these sources, um, especially Retramnus and um, possibly another theologian, uh, John Scotus uh, Erugina, and uh, again, it was the same basic argument. If the Eucharist truly contains the reality, then it's not a symbol. And if it's not a symbol, it's not a sacrament. Beringer got into a lot of trouble, uh, specifically with the um, Archbishop of Canterbury, Lanfranc. And then uh, later, there's a, there was a, a, a huge Europe-wide uh, controversy about this. And uh, the popes at the time then settled the matter, saying, this is not the faith of the church, and you have just invented a novelty. Regardless of uh, Retramnus and all of that, this is not the orthodox faith. And the whole role of the magisterium, the papacy, the teaching office of the church, is to safeguard the teachings of the church and truth. So it's quite legitimate that the papacy then suppressed Beringer's work because it's doing its job in doing so. That's exactly what the point of the magisterium is, whether it's the whole college of bishops or the, the pope, to, uh, to actually constrain theologians from becoming too arrogant, which happens sadly all the time. S symbolism versus realism. So we, we've got this, uh, we've already mentioned this, uh, Beringer emphasized the empty sign too much in, in a sacrament. Um, but his, uh, some of his adversaries, Humbert de Silva Candida, uh, went too far the other way. And he was actually the, uh, the legate who was responsible for the excommunication of uh, um, Michael Cellularius, who was the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople, one of the contributing factors behind the Great Schism. But his, uh, his understanding was completely unorthodox as well, saying that the, if you chomp on the appearances of bread, then you actually, uh, your teeth uh, are chomping on Christ's substance himself, which is not what the church teaches. Uh, so Lanfranc um, was one of the first really to make it very clear the differences between the appearances, which he called species, uh, it'd be later called accidents, uh, using the language of Aristotle, but species and accidents are pretty much two uh, words for the same thing. And then you've got the substance, the idea of substance. So we're starting to get this language well before Aristotle, this language of substance, an underlying substance which is different from the appearances. And Lanfranc, he wasn't a great theologian, but uh, he, th this was an important uh, development. He quotes Saint Ambrose saying that well, for God, uh, changing something substance is easy. Because he did it at the, uh, the 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 wedding at Cana, so it's always there's a precedent that such a change is no problem for God whatsoever. And again, again, uh, Gitmund of Aversa uh, um, using terms like substantially changed. So the seeds there for transubstantiation, which will come later, um, are there. We're just trying to find terms and the right language to describe something the church has always taught. And a timeline then up to the rediscovery of Aristotle. So it's, uh, we're, we're emphasizing the fact that this 
the terminology of substance and a change of substance predated Aristotle, has got nothing to do with Aristotle. The belief that the doctrine that um, this kind of language attempts to describe and define has got nothing to do with aligning itself to a specific and particular philosophy. So it's not aligned to Aristotle. When Aristotle was rediscovered in, in the West in the 12th century, uh, then it provided a structure for us to be able to use terms consistently and without confusion. Uh, half of the problems that have been, for example, at the Council of Ephesus uh, and at Nicaea were understanding how everybody was using terms. If you're using the same word in completely different ways and not realising you're both using them in different ways, you can't actually have a constructive argument, have a constructive discussion to gain consensus. So having a structure, which is what Aristotle provided, with very clearly defined terms that everybody was using in the same way was a gift to the church. The church does not ground its doctrine on Aristotelian uh, language and, uh, and philosophy. The first use of this word transubstantiation came in um, with Pope Innocent III at the beginning of the 13th century. And then by uh, the time of the uh, Fourth Lateran Council 1215, uh, transubstantiation, so uh, trans substance, it's pretty clear, it's a change of substance. The Church Fathers have been saying this for centuries, but we've just now got a fixed word with a fixed definition that the Church has used as a, as a tool, as an instrument, in order to describe a, um, a concept that underlies it. It's worth uh, a little note, but it's not a commonly known heresy, and it's uh, not something that's um, often come across in Panation. Uh, there was a period uh, in the, um, well, across a number of centuries, but uh, really from the, the 12th, all the way actually to the beginning of the 14th century, a minor little movement which discussed this idea of the bread uh, becoming um, united almost with uh, with the divinity of Christ. Uh, so it's something that had been uh, condemned by the church and in fact by the, by the time its greatest advocate in the 14th century uh, came about, transubstantiation had for a century already been uh, defined as the doctrine of the church, so it was a non-starter really. But but it's not really been seen um, since. But there are similarities to some of the uh, the Reformation ideas as well. In the 13th century, uh, we got one of the greatest gifts to the church, uh, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and uh, well, he wasn't the only proponent of a movement of theology called scholasticism, but he was one of its uh, most important advocates. And it was just a system of using the structure, as I say, of Aristotle in order to formulate very complex answers to um, a lot of doctrinal issues. Now, the church has never formally said that uh, Aquinas is right in everything, and, it, and he's not. He's an important input into any kind of theological studies because uh, uh, well, successive popes have defended uh, and, and have made it very clear that his teaching is to form the, the core of seminary education. That went a little bit wonky in the 20th century, but certainly has come back into to play now. And Aquinas gives such a beautiful systematic um, means of combining the structure of Aristotle using terms, which is pure observation and reason. It's not paganism, it's not heathenism, it's a general observation of the world around it and giving it a Christian theological synthesis, which knits together um, beautifully. But the church does not depend on Thomistic, what was called after Thomas Aquinas, Thomistic Aristotelian uh, structure to define its its doctrine and that's important even though it's very useful the church does not depend on St. Thomas or Aristotelianism to, uh, to to be able to define its doctrines and there are so many different parts of his greatest work the Summa Theologica uh, that's uh, it's worth I'm not going to go through all of these but it's worth having a, a quick uh, look at then you can um, freeze the slides as you need 
But uh, it's things about, uh, yes, uh, the change of substance uh, mentions transubstantiation, which has been def uh, defined as a teaching of the Church. Uh, what can be used in the Eucharist? Uh, the, uh, the, the practicalities and, and some hypothetical cases. It's very clear that bread and wine are the only valid matter for use. We can't use anything else. Water ought to be mixed as well. Um, and we'll come to this uh, subject now. Uh, something that Luther, again, in the, the, uh, the 16th century was very critical of, why do we mix water with the wine at the, the chalice before consecration? Well, firstly, it is a universal tradition all across the early Christian church. There is not one part um, of the, the Christian world uh, that can trace its origin in the local churches back to an apostle that does not mix water with wine for the consecration. Uh, it, is, it was a, a universal custom at the time of Christ and there is no doubt from sacred tradition we are reassured that Christ himself did it and it is part of the first century Jewish Seder ritual. So it's through tradition because we're not Bible alone Christians. But also then after that, that practicality of actually di diluting the wine, that's why they did it because it was very strong. There's a, then a symbolism of uh, the, the water and the wine coming from the side of Christ uh, at the cross, which is attested to in the Gospels. And also it's um, a symbolism of our humanity in the water being mixed with the divinity of Christ in the wine which is then commingled and, and becomes as one. So yeah, the whole Christ is under um, each so, uh, species, so we can uh, uh, receive um, the whole Christ under each, uh, the, uh, the appearances of bread, appearances of wine. Uh, a common misconception about the Eucharist is trying to understand and imagine what we mean when we say the Christ is uh, really present. When we move the host, does Christ move around? and uh, what part of Christ's flesh. I know a seminarian uh, that I went to seminary with was really struggling with this. He was saying, I'm trying to imagine um, our Lord's leg or his arm under the appearances. And that's actually missing the point. The substance of Christ is present, not as a particular part of his body, but it is the uh, almost in an abstract concept that the substance of Christ is present underneath it. So it's not, it's not local. We do not, when we move the appearances of um, bread and, the, uh, and, and the, the chalice, the wine, the appearance of wine, which is the precious blood, we're not moving Jesus around in heaven. He's not moving locally in heaven when we do that. We are only moving the outer, what we call the accidental properties of the Eucharist. The substance is underlying it, but we are not moving our Lord locally uh, by doing that. When we press our teeth onto the Eucharist, we are only pressing our teeth into the accidents, the outward appearances. And if we uh, look at the, the Eucharist and examine it scientifically, we will find uh, that we are presented only with the accidental properties, which are bread and wine. And if we drink too much of the precious blood, we will get drunk because those are the accidental properties that we uh, perceive. Um, and we'll go into that again. It, it, accidents, we mentioned that before. Um, appearances, species, accidents, in different periods, there have been different words to describe it. But now we're going to start using um, this term accidents to describe the, the appearances more consistently. Again, receiving communion under both kinds, we receive the full body, blood, soul and divinity under either kind. So you don't have to receive the precious blood to have received uh, the full Christ because Christ's glorified body is not separated from his blood and it's called concomitants. Uh, there, there is no separation, so you receive everything. He's not, his glorified body isn't separated from his soul, and it is his glorified body that we receive in substance um, at, at the, the time of reception of communion. And it's not subjective. It, it, we, we receive Christ whether we're properly disposed or not, and, and if we're not properly disposed, then we bring judgment on ourselves. But it's not a subjective spiritual reception. We are receiving the full substance of Christ under the appearances of um, the bread or the wine. 
worth mentioning um, Corpus Christi because St. Thomas Aquinas was intimately involved uh, in that. Um, and it was a, a gradual development from a local feast um, in the, the Diocese of uh, Liège. The Pope made it a universal uh, feast, um, at least uh, across the, uh, uh, the Western Church celebrated the Thursday after Trinity Sunday and uh, he asked St Thomas Aquinas uh, to write the hymns for the office or well, write um, the, what's called the divine office for that feast which of course was brand new and so might be familiar and hopefully are familiar uh, with uh, some of the hymns O Sanitaris Hostia and Tantum Ergo Sacramentum which are uh, the last verses from longer hymns but uh, benediction is something which fell off um, practice, you know, the practice of it became uh, less common uh, in the 20th century, late 20th century and it, bizarrely so and it's damaged the faith uh, quite frankly so we need to, to bring that back. Um, so going back to the Eucharist as sacrament now uh, we've got, we mentioned this before going back to when we're talking about sacraments in general We've got different components. We got, we, remember we were talking about signs and symbols. Now in every sacrament, we've got different symbols, but all of them have something called matter and all of them have something called form. Now form is the words that are said. That action has to be given some kind of significance by the words. If I'm pouring water over somebody's head and I don't say any words, they'll assume I'm either uh, playing a prank on them or I'm trying to give them a, a wash. If I use the words, I baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which are the words our Lord himself uh, instituted. So we can't change the words. If we use other words, then we damage the symbol, the sign, which is the very nature of the sacrament. The matter, so each sacrament has matter. Um, in the Eucharist, the matter is the bread and the wine, and you can't choose anything else because if you're doing any using anything else, you're damaging the sign and making the sacrament no longer valid. So we have to use the words of institution and bread and wine. We can't use anything else apart from that. And we, well, in this case, only a priest can confect the Eucharist because the Eucharist is a sacrifice and a sacrifice requires a priest. So that means only an ordained priest who has that mark on his soul, a character on the soul, uh, can, can offer the sacrifice of the Mass. Uh, that then, the words, again, it's a cooperation with God's grace that he has given us. He's asked us to do this. We haven't invented it. He's asked us to do this. So with the, um, the bread and the wine, with the, the priest, with the intention of, of doing um, what the church does, with the form, this is my body and this is my blood, that by virtue of the action causes a supernatural change and a change in substance in this case to come about uh, and, and it is a cause of, of grace that we can't see. During the, uh, the, the Latin Rite Mass, uh, which is the, the Western uh, Mass, we have um, the oldest um, uh, Eucharistic prayer, which is our tradition more, more so than anything, the canon of the Roman Rite, which deserves a special place of honour. Uh, there's a, a slight difference between us and the East in the uh, the discussion as to exactly when that change takes place but the east the eastern orthodox believe exactly the same thing that we do they just um, have a different terminology they haven't defined it quite as clearly and they uh, they believe that the uh, the real action uh, well the, the what's called the epiclesis the coming down of the holy spirit has a, a particular significance it's all in context of the whole thing, but uh, the, the Eucharist um, uh, is confected at the epiclesis, whereas we would say, uh, then uh, bring in Gregory of Nyssa, so it's not just a Western tradition, the separation of the body from the blood is itself a sacramental, i.e. Uh, using signs, act of sacrifice. The consecration of the body and the consecration of the blood, the act of separating blood out from the flesh of the victim is itself a sacrificial action. And that, that is uh, the point, at least in uh, the Roman rite, the, the Latin rite, that uh, the consecration is 
uh, believed to happen, which is why we ring the bells and uh, bow at that uh, that point. And Aquinas would have something to say about uh, the, the the bread and wine aren't annihilated. The substance isn't annihilated then to be replaced without any kind of connection between the uh, the, the flesh and the blood. There is a change, not an annihilation and something new happening. One changes into the other at the level of substance. And now what we mean by substance, um, again, we've said uh, substance isn't what we would regard it to be in the 21st century. You need to look at the the video we've done on substance to understand the real depth philosophy, in-depth philosophy behind it. But what we see by science, by our scientific methods, is the accidental properties. The substance is completely different from atoms and molecules. When we're talking about substance, we're not saying that the atoms and molecules of bread and wine stop um, being bread and wine. And then if you examine the Eucharist under a microscope, you would find the molecular structure has changed into something that's discernible as flesh and blood. That's completely missing the point. That is not what we mean by substance at all. In fact, that's a common misapprehension. And uh, even by people like Richard Dawkins, uh, that's all discussed in, in the other video. Missing the point of what substance is. There is a difference between the accidents and the substance. The substance is much more at the philosophical level. And it is not in conflict with science at all. Anybody who thinks transubstantiation doesn't uh, tie in with science either doesn't understand science or doesn't understand the philosophy at the end of the day. So, uh, summary, uh, summary uh, the real presence um, depends on the signs being visible. So it's linked. The, the sacramental signs have to be there and the real presence after consecration is there until the signs fade. So it's not just a short term presence and after mass is finished, it's reverted back to bread and wine. We absolutely reject that. While it is still discernibly bread and wine, the presence remains until it, uh, it, it degrades or whatever and, and the accidental properties are no longer bread and wine uh, and it's changed into something else, then the presence ceases, which is why we have to be very careful with what we do with the consecrated hosts and de um, deal with the precious blood, the ablutions after mass very, very carefully we never ever throw the precious blood away. Can anything other than bread and wine be used in the Eucharist? No, absolutely not. Again, we're missing the point. We are divorcing the Eucharist from thousands of years of Jewish and Christian practice. The Jewish religion, Melchizedek, manna, everything uh, in that uses bread and wine and points towards the Eucharist. If we decide unilaterally to do something else, we're not acting with the mind of the church, we're just making something up. Uh, and again, the sacraments come through the church. It's not for us to decide to change anything. Uh, also, it's instituted by Christ himself. And there's, there's actually a sacrificial theology um, with using the fruit of the grape, the fruit of the grain as well. We find in Ignatius of Antioch uh, as much as anything that um, and, and Corinthians the the grapes are crushed the grains are destroyed in the making of bread but they come together as we come together sacrificially uh, to to make up the body of Christ so the grapes and the grains are crushed and become together and become one they start out as individuals and they become one. If you start replacing the Eucharist with something else, you lose all of that symbolism. And also, yeah, without any authority, you've just decided to change the sacramental signs. Only Christ can do that. So at the uh, Middle Ages, uh, we are starting to come towards the Reformation now, and the Reformation didn't just come out of nowhere. So we have to understand what was going on at the end of the Middle Ages to appreciate what the Reformers were reacting against, or at least what informed them, what drove them. Uh, one of the most important proto-Reformers uh, was John Wycliffe in the 14th century. 
and uh, an Oxford scholar, is, is a, a lot of his philosophical works uh, still um, remain, you'll find actually all of these reformers were philosophers as well as theologians. Uh, a lot of the, the reformed uh, traditions went away from seeing the importance in philosophy, but their founders themselves viewed their theology through a lens of a particular philosophy, and we'll get into this uh, shortly. Um, Wick Wycliffe was, uh, was an Oxford um, uh, professor, uh, but he was uh, particularly well known, not just with the rejection of church authority, but um, a rejection of the realist interpretation of the Eucharist. So he rejected transubstantiation and he's more uh, a symbolist. So it's, um, it's a sign, uh, an empty sign. Again, the Catholic uh, interpretation is, yes, we know it's a sign, but it's a sign that contains the reality. And that's the difference. Council of Constance, um, Wycliffe, uh, he, he kind of died in, um, in obscurity. But his, his teachings permeated Europe. They went straight across Europe. And uh, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, you've got um, people like Jan Hus, who furthered that agenda and uh, uh, caused a, you know, had a big movement. Again, it's in preparation uh, of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and, and had a lot, pretty much, they paved the way for it. Because so, uh, Luther didn't just come from nowhere. Uh, the Council of Constance was then uh, um, called to deal with this, and uh, Wycliffe and Huss were condemned. What was very unfortunate about Constance is that uh, Huss was uh, guaranteed safe conduct, and that was reneged. With that uh, again set the scene when, the, when safe conduct was guaranteed to the Council of Trent. Uh, that was brought up, obviously. How can we believe anything you say when you denied safe conduct to? Huss, but nevertheless, it's, that's what happened. A common charge against um, the Catholic Counter-Reformation and the, 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 uh, the, uh, in defence of the Reformers were that they were, especially those who hold to quite Catholic views within Reformed communities, was that the Reformers weren't themselves heretics. They were reacting against um, an incorrect teaching that was prevalent in the Catholic Church at the end of the Middle Ages. We have to take uh, the context of some of the greatest theologians of the late Middle Ages and those who influenced Luther. Gabriel Biel was uh, one of the most important uh, and certainly uh, Luther studied, uh, we know Luther studied his works because he left margin annotations in, in Biel's books. Uh, so. Um, Luther knew exactly what the Catholic uh, doctrine of the Mass, so did all the other reformers. Was They weren't reacting against um, a, a parody, they were reacting against the reality of the Catholic teaching. Biel, I'm not going to read it all out, but it was very clear the Mass is a sacrifice, it is offered for the living and the dead. Um, it is not a separate sacrifice from Christ, it is the same sacrifice uh, on the cross that is represented. Remember anamnesis. It is time and space uh, are dissolved and Golgotha becomes present on the altar. And so that we eat the flesh and the blood and we can apply the merits of that one sacrifice which we're representing, not reenacting or reinstituting. It's, we are sharing in that one sacrifice, bringing it present and making it accessible for us and that we can apply the merits of that sacrifice for a specific intention for the living and the dead. That is still the Catholic teaching on it and is what Gabriel taught and that undoubtedly is what Luther knew what the, the, the church's teaching was. One thing that is critical about, and it's very um, distinct about Catholic and Greek Orthodox um, theology, because we, by and large, we believe the same thing. But our Lord became flesh. The Word became flesh. When he ascended, he didn't become Word again. And this emphasis in the Reformation about the Word and the spiritual is a kind of to, to the eyes of a Catholic looks like an excarnation that he came down in flesh went back into heaven in flesh 
and now he's just left his word and that's all that there is and it's a spiritual reception of his uh, uh, any kind of idea of, of this flesh being truly here in the present is is a matter of just empty symbolism and I think that's a legitimate uh, um, criticism really the the whole Catholic sacramental structure is incarnational the word was made flesh he is still flesh he came and pitched his tent among us and that's what we it's key to understanding the Eucharist he didn't just go into heaven and take his flesh with him he he has connected heaven and earth and when we represent the sacrifice we truly eat that incarnated flesh to summarize the Catholic uh, position uh, was there's one sacrifice of Christ priest altar victim those three components uh, last supper was a, a Jewish Passover meal four cups of wine uh, normally you'd eat the flesh of the lamb the, uh, the Mass, therefore, is a remembrance, but not of, of a past event, it's bringing the anam uh, anamnesis, bringing that past event into the present and applying the merits of Christ's one sacrifice to a particular intention for the living and the dead. And that's what Mass stipends are about. That's what offerings are for. When you ask a priest to say Mass for a particular intention, the sacrifice of Christ is represented, that one sacrifice, we are come back into union with that one sacrifice, we receive the flesh from that one sacrifice and receive the blood in its incarnated form, and then the merits of Christ's uh, sacrifice are applied for a specific intention for those who've asked the donors or whoever they've asked for Mass to be. Um, offered for and that is um, a blessing it can be a thanksgiving it, it, it can um, ask for a particular blessing for family friends or or and this is particularly important for the souls in purgatory we still very very much believe this and saying mass for the dead is one of the most important acts of charity that we can offer it confers um, charity, um, it, it's, it nourishes us, the, the real presence of Christ nourishes us bodily and spiritually, just as the manna nourished the, uh, the Jews. And it's a, it's a sacrament of unity, so that's why we don't allow just anybody to receive communion. We're part of one visible church. We are one family. The Jews in their Passover meal didn't invite anybody that wasn't in their family who didn't believe the same things to take part in their ritual meal. So this idea of open communion, especially those who don't believe the same things um, uh, about the Eucharist um, uh, as us, I can't understand the logic of somebody wanting to or demanding to receive communion when the priest says the body of Christ, they have a completely different understanding of what that means to the priest. That's not unity. That's a, a really a stretching of logic to its breaking point. That's not what the practice of the church has been for 2000 years. So it's not unjust, it's not unreasonable. We come together as a family who believe and assent to the same truths of faith. And for those who say, well, it doesn't really matter if Christ is present or not. If Christ is present under the Eucharist, I just can't understand the argument for anybody to say, well, it doesn't matter if he's there or not. I mean, what, what is, what's th the logic behind that? Of course it matters. It's, it's fundamental to our faith. If he's there or if he's not, uh, it, it's, it's one of the most important things that we can ask.